Uh, good morning. I'm hosting again. I don't know when that happened. Uh, uh, I don't know ago. how to do this job anymore. Um, <laughs> hi, I think it's Monday. We did it, all of you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us once again on SJU. We have a bunch of great stories to talk about. We're going to talk about some Black Widow, uh, get into that Marvel. But also, uh, of course, I have to uh, introduce uh, 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 my lovely other panelists. I am really bad at this. Wow, I am unstudied. We got me a Joe Star. You're great at this. Shut your face. Uh, we got me a Spencer Gilbert. You don't have to introduce us. It's fine. No, yeah, I like, feel like we... I don't know. That's how you just be the now, angel right? and devil on your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Do more Simpsons quotes. Do more Simpsons. There would never be a different. Um, so uh, uh, Black Widow director Kate Shortland has spoken on the past and future of the character. We're going to get into it. It's all in support of direct relief and Black Lives Matter. There will be links in the description for how you can support. Um, I, I got, And I will warn you guys right now, I am fostering a cat. Uh, uh, he's real needy. So if I uh, occasionally turn around and go like, what are you doing? Don't do that. That's that's not for mouths. Um, that's what I'm doing is I'm talking to a cat you haven't met. All right, segment one, Scar Joe to pass torch to Flo Pew. This is via Empire. Empire talked to Black Widow director Kate Shortland before the first movie in MCU's phase four is uh, released in theaters. Probably, I mean, we'll do theaters eventually. I don't know. Uh, um, so she spoke about their approach to the story and the inclusion of Florence Pugh, who plays uh, Yelena, who is um, a longstanding. She's been um, one. She's been the blonde Black Widow since like '99. Um, you know, when I was a child, probably. Um, <laughs> so uh, one of the things that the director said was that Kevin Feige realized that the audience would expect an origin story. So of course we went in the opposite direction and we didn't know how great Florence Pugh would be. That's good. Okay. Um, Florence Pugh is literally, sorry, that is my, one of my many alarms. I mean. um, Florence Pugh <laughs> did realize, yay, we did it guys. I'm so glad that I'm hosting. Um, we didn't realize how great Florence Pugh would be, which that, that can't be true. Um, we knew what she would be great, but we didn't know how great. Scarlet is so gracious. Like, oh, I'm handing her the baton. So it's going to propel another female storyline. Um, Florence Pugh is playing Yelena. And yeah, again, go to the Marvel, uh, go to the Marvel Wiki page. There is so much information on Yelena. She really is a character with a deep, deep history. She's been around for like 20 years. I'm not doing the math on that. It makes me sad, but the link will be in the description. And so uh, cast members were originally kind of playing coy about if we would see P or Yelena, if this was like a Yelena uh, origin story, if we were gonna see more of her, but it, it's kind of nice that they're just letting us know um, that that's what's happening. Mostly probably, because you know, what else are they talking about? There's nothing else to talk about. Um, and so obviously, do we feel like she is being set up for a future film or do you actually think that this is like a spoiler and it takes away from your experience? Joe. Uh, look, I'm just happy we can get back to pretending like everything's normal and just uh, being handed everything that happens in the upcoming Marvel slate to us on a platter by Marvel uh, years before it comes out. You know, uh, I wasn't interested in having Spider-Man showing up in Civil War as a surprise. I wanted to know who was playing him, when it would happen, who gave him his pajamas. Uh, I needed all of that ahead of time. So this, this feels more back to normal uh, to me. It's also if the, the character is basically Black Widow Jr. So I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like a spoiler to me. Mm. I'm good with it. Maybe not as powerful as a James Bond Jr., but pretty close. Um, Spencer, do you also agree? Ding. Because th this, has been a <laughs> this has been one of those um, in the last, you know, not even the last phase, but in the last couple of years of Marvel, everything got real secretive, whereas before they were kind of talking about stuff more. Um, do you like that they're going back to this non-spoilery uh, uh, phase where they're talking more about what we might expect? Um, do you think it's just because, like, it's COVID and we got nothing else to talk about and they want to make sure we're talking about them? Mm, I love it. Um, it's like sliding back into a well-worn Snuggie. Uh, it reminds me of the year 2006, Danielle and Joe. Um, <laughs> I was in theaters uh, watching the uh, uh, brouhaha comedy Beer Fest with my buds. Oh, yeah, yeah. And in that movie, Beer Fest, uh, uh, Farva, known in this movie as Landfill, uh, he falls into a vat of beer. 
and he drinks himself to death. Very sad. Mm-hmm. Trying to get uh, Grandma's old beer recipe, um, but he he's he's uh, double crossed by the Germans and and, mm. and locked into in the beer vat. Um, I was heartbroken, uh, much like I was when Black Widow, when Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow died in Endgame. Uh, mm-hmm. I was inconsolable. But in that movie, Beer Fest, a, a mere scene and a half later, uh, it turns out that Landfill had a twin brother, Gil, who asks everyone to call him Landfill so that there's no confusion. And I feel like this is what we're getting with Florence Pugh. She's like, Black Widow's dead, but here I am. And it'd just go a lot smoother if you could call me Black Widow. I like it. It's like it never happened. No stakes. Black, Black Widow is dead. Long live Black <laughs> Widow. Um, do you Are you excited to see uh, Florence Pugh take over a major role in the MCU? Yeah, Florence Pugh's great. Get that money. Uh, um, yeah. that's, you know. that's kind of where I'm at. Man, get that money, Florence Pugh. Like, it's, I think everyone should get one. If we're going to keep doing these movies, and we are, then everyone who is good at movies should get one of these so that they can keep doing, like, the dumb, small stuff that I want to see them do. Do and, the thing that buys you the house and gets you the mortgage, and then do dumb stuff that I like. Yeah. I like these things, too, but, like, yeah, the variation in movies is good. I do think Black Widow is going to be super fun, and um, uh, and Florence Pugh is going to be great, but, like, you know, this is, this is a sitcom. It, it'd be like if they killed off Joey and then recast Joey. Um, it, it, it's, it's yeah, as Florence Pugh, which okay. I also support. That's, um, yeah. it, it, it's it's just like a complete admission that like you know, don't worry, everything's going to always stay the same, more or less. And we and, and if you know we lose uh, Chris Hemsworth Thor, we're going to get Natalie Portman Thor. If we lose uh, yeah. this Captain America, we're going to get Anthony Mackie Captain America. Like it's kind of funny at this point, which is also the case in the comics. Different people take on the mantle all the time. Yeah, I I wonder if. Year, decades and decades and decades ago, when they started, you know, pumping out Robins and Superboys, if they realized that they were setting up a, a, a can't miss roadmap for a continual cinematic uh, onslaught, you know, like, yeah. oh, the guy aged yeah. out, Captain America Jr., he's here, boom. Um, I, I just, oh my God, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry, you remember Dinosaur where there was, <laughs> Dinosaurs where there was that, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Hilarious lab. baby. The hilarious baby, but there was also like the the um, the dude who had that that like lab uh, uh, show, and he would always kill off the Billy, and he'd be like, "We got to get another Billy." Like, that's kind of what this reminds me of. Um, we're just getting more Billies, you guys. It's cool. There will always be another Billy. Like we're good. That's oh, some deep good. dinosaur lore, and I respect it. <laughs> Sorry, it is yeah. uh, okay. Someone's uh, been spending some time on drummers. the dinosaur <laughs> fandom community page on fandom.com. Look, we all know that I'm a big dino head. Uh, (laughs) We all know that if we know there's one thing about Daniel Radford, it's dino heads. Um, And so Marvel Studios did, uh, they got Pew uh, right before she had a breakout a few months with Midsommar and Little Women. Um, How good is Marvel uh, and their casting directors and everyone who works with them for like actually being able to spot new talent? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a chicken and the egg thing because it's also like, so many people at this point, respected actors, uh, uh, have said yes. So it's not Actors. like, oh, you're slumming it in a Marvel movie. It's like, oh, I get to do a Marvel movie. They think it's like a recognition on both sides. Like, you're cool. You're cool. All right, let's do this. It's not like doing a commercial in Japan like that you hope no one will ever see. Or, or a Chinese vitamin uh, POV. Or if you're you know. Tom Hiddleston making a delicious plate of way too much fruit and vegetables, uh, uh, you should have a vitamin for that. Which if you've up. never it's a, it's seen, a fantastic ad. Yeah, you should go time that to, to see that vitamin ad. It definitely feels e, like I sexed me in that, which I think is the point because, like, I, no, you're the, in the you're in the perspective of the of person the, who just woke up next to Tom Hiddleston as he's making you a way too large fruit plate. There's a lot to unpack. Hey, can we pause on spoiling Black Widow and spoil? Okay, because I was just going to ask you guys to do your best. Tom Hiddleston is seducing me into eating fruits and vegetables, but if you guys want to <laughs> do this, because this commercial asks a lot of us. Oh, hello. <laughs> I didn't see you there. I prepared breakfast. <laughs> it's made with real, we have vitamin capsules right here. <laughs> Don't forget your vitamins. Don't forget uh, your vitamins. I'll be gone on a, on a movie for a little he bit. Has Stay come, up, he has for come me. into town to <laughs> wreck your home. Like, we have to assume he's, he, he's coming in to have a fling. Like, yeah. he's, he's cheating on whoever he's with. He's You're not staying on whoever you with. What sentence did I just say? (laughs) All I'm saying is that with us as the POV character, it's asking a lot of choices of us at the gate. He's staying long enough 
for him to be worried about our bowels. And I think that that is yes. admirable. He, okay. No, this, this is not, he's not, he's not hitting it and quitting it. He wants to make sure that your engine runs so he can get it later. And that's when he wakes up and he's like, oh, hello. How I'll, screwed I'll, up is that? <laughs> How's your colon? Is it clean yet? I'll be back when it is. <laughs> Have you I had to find a vitamin D? I globe trot through and I make sure they all take their vitamins. <laughs> okay, well now it sounds like he has a harem of women and he's just like, please keep these women. Or men, or men. Or There's men, a, that's the, true. You know, we don't the, know. The, the brilliance of the commercial is you get to be with Tom Hiddleston. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Do you like kiwi? <laughs> Here's way too much kiwi. Here's way too much. Ki- I can't do sexy face. Like I feel like Spencer nailed it. Joe, it's I didn't see your sexy it's face. I can't. It's too early for Spencer. You want to do a sexy face? Do your. <laughs> oh hello. Good morning. <laughs> Mixing quail eggs with this eight pounds of strawberries. <laughs> oh, there it is. There it is. Because my first thought is just to go like. Hey, girl, you like flax? Um, <laughs> which is probably what if Tom Hilton did that? <laughs> the choice. Hey, hey man, you like flax? You like flax? <laughs> yeah, you like that flax. Uh, all right, back Are to- Are you regular? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> would you like to be? <laughs> would you like to be? Uh, okay, so we do, we gotta uh, uh, get back uh, Black to- Widow, the, Black the, Widow, Black Widow. Black Widow, Black Widow, who also likes flax, Flax Widow. Um, <laughs> so they talked, they did, uh, I, follow up with the director about what happened with Black Widow and Endgame. There was a, a lot of people were upset because like she didn't get a funeral. There was a, like that big funeral for Tony and she basically got like two people uh, or two seconds of people being really sad on a dock. Um, and so she did mention that uh, Scarlet said that when she spoke with her, Scarlet was like, uh, Black Widow don't want no funeral. Um, Black Widow would just want every, like, she's too private for that. Um, which is like, well, she's dead. So funerals aren't for you. They're for other people. Why am mm. I so chatty today? Um, so what, what, uh, the director said they did in this film was to allow the ending to be the grief the individuals felt rather than a big public outpouring, which they feel like is a fitting ending for her um did you feel like uh black widow got super ripped off by not having like the huge um funeral scene that like tony got in endgame or movies have this thing it's it's called pacing and when part of it you're making a movie like endgame which is already insane and and carrying this herculean task insane uh, you in don't... the endgame i have to stop oh. i'm so insane in the endgame <laughs> i have um... to stop <laughs> <laughs> and it's already got too many frames. Um, <laughs> you look. If there had been, if they just hit the brakes on that movie to have eight funerals, like oh well, like, now Black Widow's got to have a funeral. Now Cap's technically gone, so we better have our Cap memorial. And uh, six Wakandan soldiers fell. And, <laughs> More than six. Uh, a couple of we lost a couple of wizards. Um, I didn't see that Pegasus that Valkyrie was riding in the second half of that fight. So we got to assume Thanos stepped on it or fell in some mud and drowned never ending story style. Like if they just stopped and started having like a string of funerals that kills the movie, it kills the movie. Black Widow, they got perfectly enough with Jeremy Renner angrily yelling, um, yeah, and throwing things in a lake or Okay, pitch, pitch, a series of one shots where everyone gets a funeral. For five on Disney Plus. <laughs> on Disney Plus, funerals. Uh, uh, but uh, Joe Star, uh, which which funeral would you like to see the most on Disney Plus? Oh gosh, I mean, um, my own probably. What, what are we talking about? Uh, <laughs> uh, not. Yeah, it's nice to see how you would have been remembered. I yeah, think the, I the Black Widow funeral would have been a little awkward because, really, like, is it just Cap or who knows about Black Widow and her life at this point? Nick you know, uh, pre two thousand eight, or mm. and even then, like they barely knew her, so it all just well, be like. Mainly she was... points out that, like in Winter Soldier, she does the Congress speech. Yes. So she's not yeah. she's not a complete unknown, but yeah, it she that doesn't mean she had a public life outside or, or other than that. Yeah, I can't tell you who spoke to Congress this year. <laughs> Nobody remembers her. Chat. Uh, like I said they, they don't sorry, go very no, far. Also, the eulogy is going to be so boring because even if Nick Fury gets to do like a eulogy, it's all redacted. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you shouldn't do things that are only on C-SPAN. Well, it um, would be a good um it'd be a good farm for spin-off movies cuz they could just name place uh, places like they keep doing with Budapest or whatever they'd be like yeah. that 
But that man will always remember Budapest. Well, it seems Ooh, like that's... and uh, Qatar. Oh, you never uh, forget the, what happened and, in Qatar. Antarctica Antar- was real. Cool. Natasha was born and bleep. Um, <laughs> it does seem like that. That's kind of what this this movie is. Sort of the framework uh, for that. Just a bunch of Russians getting together to uh, to have a few uh, to have a few drinks and remember remember their pal. I like that, Ryan. Is there anything the chat has to say about Russians who drink? and remember their buds? Uh, not quite yet. The, I think the delay will cause, in about 30 seconds, we'll get some. Does anybody like, uh, do they feel like uh, um, like maybe this is too spoilery or do they like that we're actually back to a point where Marvel is talking about the movies instead of never talking about anything? Yeah, I think there's a couple of good comments here. So uh, at Little Honor uh, says, I feel like it's not a spoiler for comic fans. Uh, I, I mm-hmm. figured that would have happened. Obviously, it's not for comic fans only, but I, I agree that like there's a little bit of like, hey, read in between the lines of, right. of, of all this. Um, uh, let's see. At uh, Almagdov compares it to Doctor Who, just like basically they can Doctor Who it mm-hmm. where they just replace it with the, the next person that comes in. Uh, at Renee uh, Jimenez says that Chris Evans and Scarlett Johansson made milk ads uh, in Mexico, where, where she lives at some point. So I just wanted to make sure that got a shout out. <laughs> we got to find right, those. Oh, we'll find that and follow that. up. Yeah, we'll do that right now. Um, and uh, let's see. And at Langley Neely uh, brings this up, and I actually I, I agree with this a little bit too, where uh, he says, I still think this is, it's a misdirect. I think she is Taskmaster. And so I do think there is a chance of the director putting this out there could also maybe be setting us up for, yeah, she sticks around, but is, does that mean she's the new Black Widow or is she just around in different you, ways? You know, it could also even just be, uh, I like the Taskmaster theory, but it could also just be a misdirect that, yeah, she's Black Widow, but also she's not, she's bad for a while. And, right. Yeah. Which I also dig. Bring back that double agent part of the character of like, whose side is she on type thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I, think, I like that. I play That's with. real good. So this is the part of the show where we take a second and I'm going to have Joe Starr talk to you a little bit uh, about uh, about uh, uh, things you can do and places you can visit. And hi, I love you. Scrolling this Google Doc. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I should have warned you ahead of time. I'm not good. You know what you guys need to watch is uh, we're doing a Hey Phantom with Robert Kirkman on Wednesday um, uh, after SJU. Again, these have been super fun. Uh, you can watch them over at phantom.com. Uh, specifically fandom.com slash videos. We have a, uh, a a link down there in the description. Uh, so come ask Robert Kirkman your zombie questions. Uh, I want to talk to this guy about how baller a move it was to just end his comic. Like, to just be <laughs> like, nope, that's the end. No PR. Uh, that's, you don't get cool moves like that anymore. And I thought that that was awesome. And uh, I want to hear him talk on it. So make sure you check out the Robert Kirkman. Uh, hey, fandom. Hit like and subscribe. All that good stuff. Uh, if you came out last week for the Fandom 5 uh, Pokemon edition, thank you guys uh, for coming and watching the show. It was super fun. It was also like high drama. Um, uh, nobody won like the original rounds and then someone came back and won like the the, the harder like challenging round and took home the money. It was a very Ooh. fun show. Very fun show. Um, so we'll be doing another one of those soon. We'll let you guys know all the details on Havat. That's a, and, and no, that is a really fun show. And Joe is, ob- I mean, obviously a really fun host. Um, and I he wore a actually, funny hat for it. What kind of funny hat? A, a, Char- a Charizard hat. It's it's on the other side of the room. Okay. Otherwise, Later, we got to get up on that Charizard hat. Um, all right. So segment two, um, we are remembering a legend um, for uh, a, a legend composer. Um, and I, I apologize. I will say right away, um, I am not great with Italian names. Um, Italian so, names like Ennio Morricone? Yes. Um, thank you, which was going to be the thing I was going to say. Um, so this is Via Variety. Uh, Ennio Morricone uh, did pass away on Monday today at the age of 91. Um You guys know him. He wrote more than 400 original film scores, including The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, Once Upon a Time in the West. Even if that is not a name that you are super familiar with, uh, or like you know his work as soon as you hear it. Um, So he's not as obviously, you know, everyone knows like a John Williams or Denny Elfman. Um, But Joe, how much of an impact uh, do you feel like Morricone has had on movies? It's it's a uh, it's weird to think back to a time where adding a like a harmonica to a movie mm-hmm. score was considered very rebellious and outside the box, but it was. Uh, Ennio Morricone really changed uh, how 
um, sort of assembly line film scores were done. Um, he made trash westerns into high art. Mm. Um, the the cool thing if you if you just follow um, his filmography like mo uh, movies he scored not just just to sort of get an idea of like the range of things he did because yeah westerns good the bad and the ugly and that's what a lot of people know him for but if you pick like five just like really essential mm. uh, of his scores that's a really cool movie day like you're going to see so many interesting films that maybe you've never seen before 1900 stuff like that um, but. You know, you you draw a direct line uh, from him to most genre directors we have yeah. today. Um, whether they're musically influenced by him, you know, John Carpenter's scores are definitely musically influenced mm -hmm. by Ennio. They're synth, but they are they're more Coney scores. Um, I think you know, he the, did the thing. Yeah, he did, and yeah, and he mm -hmm. did do the the yeah. thing. Um, and then you know, like listen to the Big Trouble in Little China score. Like it is Once Upon a Time in the West. It is Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, just with an electric guitar and a keyboard. Um, but, uh, you know, even if it's not just like, oh, my music sensibilities are from him, like Edgar Wright is Edgar Wright because those scores stayed in his head. You know, uh, Robert Rodriguez is Robert Rodriguez because those scores stayed in his head. So, I mean, the, the guy's impact on film cannot be understated. Right. It's literally like it's if if anyone, anyone, in, and I, I talk about the mom test and other tests, um, but anyone if you do you know the, the the beginning of the score of the good the bad and the ugly that is your language mm -hmm. oh, beautiful whistle thank you <laughs> that I is your <laughs> though it's gorgeous like that but no but that is like everyone immediately knows exactly what you're talking about because yeah. he that defined that intro and that song defined an entire genre for a, a whole generation and yeah. like you know that's very very rare the um, idea what, the idea that your music can become shorthand for yeah. a feeling is crazy like I, there's a i think there's only a few little refrains that are like that like if something evil's going on you know or, or crap president is on tv and someone goes bum, 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 i know exactly what they mean yeah. if there's a tense situation going on in front of you and your friends like <laughs> like I know exactly what, what they mean. And I, that's insane that a piece of music you wrote became uh, shorthand, like shorthand language. Yeah, almost like a trope in and of itself, which is mm -hmm. uh, amazing for a sound. Um, so Spinny, uh, do you have a favorite Marconi score? Uh, I love the score to Once Upon a Time in America. Um, mm, his, uh, right. I think it's his last, not his last movie, um, Sergio Leone's last movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like, uh, it, it's Marconi, but it's like he used a lot more pan flute, which I'm a sucker for pan flute. Man. <laughs> <laughs> you get on those 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 horizontal pipes, and I am in. So it's uh, it, it takes some of the edge off, like to the point where like it toes the line between tense, uh, a western standoff, uh, and like spa music. Uh, so you mm -hmm. can just put it on the background, and, and it's great. Uh, I recommend everyone work to the score today of uh, Once Upon a Time in America. Oh, that's nice, Joe Star. Uh, I'll throw you at Days of Heaven. Uh, it's uh, his first, um, obviously he won, you know, Tarantino, and prop, sorry, I listed genre directors and I dared not mention Tarantino, so delete <laughs> your comment. Uh, I apologize. Uh, Tarantino really, I think, pushed and kept pushing and kept pushing until that man got his uh, well-deserved Oscar. Mm -hmm. But the first one he was nominated for was Days of Heaven. And it's just this kind of just quiet and sad. It's a, it's a Malick movie, but it, this the mm. score is just, sort of haunting and very like chill. Whereas, you know, his Western stuff is like, yeah, uh, it's not like that at all. That was a horrible example that I just made. <laughs> no. um, Jesus. Uh, but yeah, it's just very meditative and, and very cool. And you should check it out. Yeah, I, uh, um, I, I really like, uh, I really like the score to a fistful of dollars. I think it's really nice. Um, and you're right. When you uh, talk about all of the people that he's influenced, um, all the way down to like, because it, it's not just obviously it's about uh, the grand scope of, of the scores and um, having like a very distinct melody, but it's also, you know, uh, small things like the Wu-Tang Clan being obviously very influenced by a lot of his mm -hmm. stuff. Um, it, it's not limited to just, and you guys know me, I am a sucker for, uh, I uh, music scores get me where I live. That is where... 
I don't care if I don't like the movie. If the score does it for me, I will cry um, like every single time. And, um, you know, with a, a lot of his his stuff, I, I do it just uh, it, it aside from obviously being um, amazing and blending this combination, especially at the time of older ways of doing scores along with newer things, um, electric guitars, different ways to use guitars, different ways to use um, uh, choral notes and, and choirs, um, along with combining all of these things together uh, in a way that uh, honestly was very new and fresh back then. Like we kind of take that stuff for granted now that everyone is always taking these different elements from different places and remixing them and making them into something new, especially when it comes to music and scores that hasn't always necessarily been the case, or at least, you know, there have people have always had different influences, but that was one of the first really huge ones where you can like, really see that this person is like wearing their influences on their sleeve and they're really making an effort to grab from everywhere. Um, and uh, that reverberated through the soundtracks he did to modern music, to the, the beats yeah. for rap albums, man. Like it's, and I'm glad that he got his Oscar. Uh, I am always one that says we got to give people their roses when they're alive and not necessarily wait until they're yeah. passed away. Um, you know, uh, that's a that's a good life. That is a good long life. Um, uh, so rest in peace. Thoughts out to his family. But man, what a uh, what a legacy. Yeah. Ryan, do we have anybody who uh, in the chat who has some memories that they'd like to talk about? Yeah, everyone's posting their different movies. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to start writing down specific ones that they said. But there's a no, great no lot of great discussion in the chat, and I hope they do that in the in the comments as well. I will say, uh, pulling off the curtain a little bit, I'm dropping something in your script. Uh, another segment. It's not breaking oh. news, but some people wanted to have us react to the Clone High stuff. And we didn't get oh, to one yeah. Friday. Oh, so yeah. Right. <laughs> Let me go ahead and refresh yeah. the script. Yeah. And I, I guess I'll just say on Ennio, like, I think yeah. you you, uh, you get from genre what you put into it, like genre films. And I think he's, he's like the best living example of that. Like that dude always rolled up his sleeves, put on his working boots and took what he was putting into those movies very seriously. And like, that's why they're good. And that's why they're... Uh, uh, they rise above the reputation of C and B, you know, that they would otherwise have. Absolutely. All right. Segment three. Oh, we're going to wing this, Ryan. We're good. Uh, Clone High and Beavis and Butthead. Uh, this is via the rap. Uh, MTV is doing a reboot of Clone High, which is in development from the original creative team of Lord Miller and Bill Lawrence. Um, the original animated series only ran for 13 episodes in the early 2000s, featured high school versions of famous historical figures, gained a cult following, including basically everyone here and probably all of you, um, in the years since its cancellation. Um, so Clone High is joining. It's not just Clone High, it's also Daria, it's also Beavis and Butthead, as these former MTV the cartoons that are going to get a second life in the 2020s. Um, for Daria, it's going to be the spinoff of Jody, which is about uh, uh, Jody, who was the black one. Um, <clears throat> so I, I was, she she was very smart and capable, and like that was actually part of her journey was her being like I don't like being tokenized, blah blah blah. Um, but also uh, Beavis and Butthead, and they're all going to be snagged by Comedy Central, which I believe all of these are under the Viacom. Um, logo anyway. Yeah, a celebrity a death. High is MTV. Clone Everything nice. else is going to come. Yeah. Um, but it's all, I, I believe all of those are, are, are uh, Viacom, I think. Um, yes. A celebrity deathmatch reboot is also in the works. Oh, that's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> well, instead of having you talk about that, Spenny, how about you tell us about why you're excited about a new Clone High? Clone High is the, it's one of the great comedies of all time uh, i i don't know how to go find it these days but i implore you if you like good things find clone high it it, it made such a mark uh off of just 10 episodes i still quote so many of them so many times in my brain because i don't say it out loud because not enough people have seen it so let's fix that <laughs> everybody go see clone high and then we can all sing makeover makeover together <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, which I'm very excited about. One thing I am interested in also, when we talk about uh, Beavis and Butthead, uh, one of the quotes that was given, and this is um, from Entertainment Weekly, Beavis and Butthead being rebooted for a Gen C world by Comedy Central. Gen so, C? What, or Gen Z world. Oh, okay. Uh, like they made uh, another gen? Oh, crap. <laughs> Joestar. What, what, 
the hell does that mean? I don't know, man. Uh, you know what? These kids, uh, aren't these kids weird? Uh, with their talking I, with and, their all, and talking all their tics. And the way they text. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, on, on one hand, I don't think Mike Judge has let us down yet. No. Uh, with his nuanced uh, thoughtfulness on the world. Um, but at the same time, I'm still kind of like, I, I, do I need Beavis and Butthead's take on, I, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> no, you can say the thing that you're thinking because I'm thinking it. Um, so I'll say it later. Like, <laughs> I will stand up for my boys, <laughs> Beavis well, and Butthead. I just want them I, to watch I, music videos. <laughs> it, well, that's the thing. I, my hope, my interpretation of that for a Gen Z audience, and I hope and dearly pray this is true, is that they're just reacting to like YouTube videos or, yeah. or TikToks or whatever, just because they don't make really, I mean, they make music videos, but they're all like single location. And it's just like whoever they could get with the largest butt then they would paint a tiger on it or whatever. Like that's, yeah. which Tigers Beavis and Butthead would love. Butts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, so I, I don't know if I've said this on the show. Uh, I have a very deep connection to Beavis and Butthead. Uh, Beavis and Butthead was my favorite show when I was growing up. So much yeah. so that me and my sister, our nicknames are based off Beavis and Butthead. Like my, no, I'm my, my sister calls me Beavis. And if you look in my phone, my sister's called Bliss. Um, we used to do the voice of each other all day long, like back and forth. Um, and it would always be like, and like when my niece was born, she couldn't say Danielle. So I was Auntie Beavis for uh, basically as long as my mom could tolerate <laughs> me being called Auntie Beavis. Um, but so Beavis and Butthead has like a very deep, uh, I have a real deep connection with that. And so I am excited for it to come back. And you're right. Like I don't, uh, if nothing else, Mike Judge is very good at surrounding himself with people who know how to have, like, mm -hmm. know how to do these nuanced things. King of the Hill is an amazing show. And if you just took it at face value, you wouldn't know that. And a lot of that is obviously uh, him. A lot of that is Wyatt Cenac. Um, It is a very good show that is, is more nuanced and great than you would think it would be. And I can't believe, or at least I hope, um, that... It's not going to get the same treatment. And yeah, man, the Beavis and Butthead, they're going to make fun of stuff and it's going to be, it's going to be great. Yeah. Um, it's going to be really, really fun. And I didn't mind the reboot that happened um, a few years ago. I, I, you know, with the, the, they did the thing with the drones and whatever. I thought it was really funny. Um, but I do uh, think, Beavis or Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, thank you. Um, but I do think that, um, yeah, like it's, it's, I, I I, I I trust, I trust that team and I trust that he's going to hire people who are going to do it. And, What's interesting now, and uh, Spencer, this is something I want to ask you about because I know how passionate you are about a lot of this stuff. Um, do you think that right now is a great time or do you think that we can expect more reboots of animation because we're all kind of oh, yeah, at I home mean, and not able to be on sets? I'm surprised it took this long. I feel like uh, the bones have been picked clean of every IP worth uh, worth two bucks and change and it's like mm -hmm. um i i feel like the comedy central viacom like the nickelodeon empire has kind of been resistant to that you can't usually find their shows on a lot of streaming services right. it's taken them a while like they've really held on and to cable there, tv but, yeah. or, or like yeah yeah so i think that this is kind of like the last dam to break um so uh we did get that rocco thing which i did like aesthetically like um just yeah, that, to look. The, C, the, the cbs all access C, uh ceo or yeah. was meant was talking about like yeah we need to get cbs all access to be like our main streaming service and like move that up so it definitely seems like yeah. they've realized what you're speaking to spencer there you go and it, it, so this is something where i actually don't feel qualified to be objective about because i watched uh nickelodeon and beavis and butthead almost and the simpsons just those are the three things i watched i don't think i watched anything else for the entire 90s um <laughs> that that's me <laughs> so I, I i can't say uh i can't say uh that it's bad because it's so good yeah. uh, but that's because i was uh 12 and uh, loved cartoons. So what's there to do uh, except say, give me more and I'll pay any amount. Yeah. Uh, y y look, do the, do the, uh, the, go the Pokemon route and just completely remake Beavis and Butthead to America, but CG. Same voice. <laughs> <laughs> Live action. Uh -huh. I'm so into it. Um, yeah. I, you know, it's not even about like, uh, what's the, the funky statement they're going to make about these kids these days. It's, I don't know if it's still funny. Like the, the Beavis and Butthead mm. reboot, it was weird. I, I was like, mm. just mean mugging it. And then like they had one of the funniest jokes I've ever heard in Beavis and Butthead. And then I went right back. It was very, 
very uh, hit and miss. It was um, they were in court, and someone was like, "Your Honor," and but had said, she said, "Your," she said, "On her." And Beavis like pauses and looks at him and says, "You know, nothing gets by you, buddy." <laughs> and I cried. It was very funny. Um, but yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I, I do agree. They just need to react to TikToks. <laughs> um, so we do have a couple of uh, stuff in the chat. Um, uh, Colson. Coolio Pulo says, uh, Daria is what I'm most excited for. I watch the series finale of Daria every couple of months. It makes me happy. Oh. Uh, Daria is a great show. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a salty girl of a certain age and glasses. I obviously liked Daria. Um, <laughs> uh, do we have any other uh, stuff from the chat? Ooh, we do. We've got uh, Pantheror. When it comes to animated shows, the only thing I'm interested in is Kevin Smith's Master of the Universe show. All right, cool. Totally get that. Uh, I am looking forward the cartoon. to that. That's another underrated I, one that got canceled after two episodes or something. Clerks the Cartoon is a fantastic example of something where the uh, commentary track elevates the entire series. I don't think that you can, I oh, think you okay. have to watch it once without the commentary track, but I think you have to watch it every single time with the commentary track. Huh. They spend, I would say, and this isn't why, because it's actually like really funny and really insightful when they're making jokes and stuff. Um, they spend at least 40% of the time just dunking on Family Guy, uh, which is also <laughs> uh, in, uh, uh, incredibly funny. But, but the show itself is genius. The second episode is a clip show to the first yes, episode. Yes. <laughs> it's so good. Why are we walking like this? It's so good. How did this get canceled? <laughs> <laughs> a, well, now we're just saying things that you guys haven't seen, but you should seriously, if you if you can, um, it is worth looking up. The I, I honestly think that it's better than a lot of the other Kevin Smithy stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess it's our show. I yeah, I, I'm I'm looking forward to doing. I think we're probably going to wind up seeing more animated stuff get announced as more people, Aeon Flux. Regret. More Aeon Flux. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, put them flies in the eyelashes. I, I think we're going to wind up seeing a lot more of that as people are trying to n navigate and negotiate how we're going to get into going into sets and stuff straight uh, going forward. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for hanging out with us, you guys. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, literally knock the rust off um, of my hosting. Uh, hey, before we go, sorry to interrupt your perfect no, outro. Please. I legit am sorry. Uh, no, but maybe, uh, you could let them know that what we're doing tomorrow, since we're uh, for common, since we're doing the commentaries again, uh, for people who oh. missed that, just give them a heads up that tomorrow we're doing honest trailer commentaries instead of an SJU. So tomorrow we're doing honest trailer commentaries. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, tomorrow we're doing honest trailer commentaries. Um, it is something that we have brought back because we have figured out how to work all of this good stuff. Um, and we miss doing it. And we know that you guys really missed having us do it. Um, we missed uh, commentating on the things that we write. And so we're really super pumped for that. So make sure that you uh, check that out. And once again, don't forget that this Wednesday we are doing the Hey Fandom with Robert Kirkman uh, from The Walking Dead and many other things. Um, so we will see you guys back here tomorrow. Have a good one.